Hey everybody, I got a new webcam, uh, Logitech C615 I believe is what it is, and it's supposed to do high definition recording up to 1080p, tried messing with the settings and everything and I can't get it uh, to produce a video that doesn't make it a little blocky and a little sort of like jerky as if it's buffering or something. So this is recorded in 720, I believe YouTube and uh, computer internet videos are typically found at 480 or 720 so I'd be curious to know your thoughts and uh, drop me a line in the comment also another thing if you like these videos go ahead make sure you subscribe I'm gonna try to uh, be a little more consistent as far as videos putting them out I've taken a break from uh, college for now uh, it's overwhelming with everything going on with work and church and, and family and other things. So I'm taking a break from college, so I should be able to have more time to put more videos out there. Uh, if you like them, drop me a line, like I said, below. Uh, hit the subscribe button. You'll also have the button at the end of the video. And uh, you know, that's that. So I've been asked this uh, before and sort of talked about it a little bit uh, offline, if you will. But... It was brought to my attention that it would probably be a good Bible study to figure out what is the Holy Spirit's role, if any, in the tribulation period. Now we know the tribulation period of uh, Daniel chapter 9, that we're going to have seven years, the 70th week of Daniel. First three and a half is going to be uh, judgment of God. The next three and a half years, considered what I would call the great tribulation period, is the latter half judgment of God. But many people are wondering what is the role, like I said, if any, of the Holy Spirit during this tribulation period. If you go ahead and if you have your Bible, and you can go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. So Paul's writing a letter to a church in Thessalonica, uh, the believers out there. And in verse 7 of chapter 2, he writes... For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Uh, so people look at that verse right there, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7, and scripture records that the mystery of wickedness or lawlessness already works, but the Holy Spirit is restraining this uh, at the moment. So all the evils that we're seeing in the world today could definitely be magnified if the Holy Spirit is taken away as what will happen during the tribulation period. That being the case, if you see me looking down a couple times, I want to make sure that I don't miss anything on my notes that I have here. So that's why. I'm not stealing information. I'm just looking uh, at the notes that I have. And I have four things specifically about the Holy Spirit, uh, past, present, and future, and what the role will be, if any, in the tribulation period. You see, many people believe that the Holy Spirit is no longer present during the tribulation period. They get that based out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. But first, I want to go ahead and talk about the distinction. There's a distinction between the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And we see that. For instance, if you were to look at Judges chapter 3, verse 10. Judges chapter 3, verse 10. We have right here, the book of Judges talk about the deliverers, uh, every man that did what was right in their own eyes, so God raised up a deliverer, uh, basically the Israelites, the Jewish people, they would sin, uh, they would turn to other gods and other nations, they would get judged, God would, they would repent, God would raise up a deliverer or a judge to free them from the oppression of the nation that God used. And then they would go ahead and be freed by that judge, and then ultimately sinning and rebelling again and having this cycle. But in Judges chapter 3, verse 10, we read, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now we're talking about the judge Othniel. And he came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. So first thing I want to point out, just three different things between the Old and the New Testament Holy Spirit actions. Basically, we read in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit came upon people. Okay, and this is more like a temporary thing. This is an empowerment, an enablement to be able to do what God wanted them to do. 
if you continue reading through the book of Judges, you'll find this is the case with numerous judges, numerous deliverers, that the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and then they are used of God through the Holy Spirit to deliver the Israelites out of the bondage, out of the tyranny, whether it's the Midianites or whoever it is. So that's the first thing, that the Spirit comes upon people. That being the case, you could turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. Another aspect of the Holy Spirit during the Old Testament you have in chapter 16, verse 14 with Saul. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So we also read in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit departs from an individual. Okay, Now there could be a debate on whether Saul is in heaven or not, but is there a debate about David? I don't believe there is. I believe David is obviously in heaven because he's going to be... Uh, ruling the Israeli, the Jewish side of the government in the Messianic kingdom. But in Psalm 51, verse 11, David prays, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So here David's praying, and this is specifically about his uh, sin with Bathsheba. And he's begging and pleading God not to take the Holy Spirit from him. Now, logic would dictate uh, asking the question, why would David be praying not to take the spirit from him if the spirit never left him in the first place? It makes me believe that the spirit had left David in the first place, hence why he's praying not to have the spirit leave again. All that to say that the spirit would come and the spirit would go. We read this in the Old Testament. But we also see in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 27. Do, 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 do. Numbers chapter 27, verse number 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. Now this is possible uh, point to the fact that the Holy Spirit came upon Joshua and was in him, or that there were certain people in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit was consistently in, if you will, uh, sort of in the same fashion as in dwelling. But we see that the Holy Spirit would come upon people. We see that the Holy Spirit would depart people, good people and bad people. And so you can see the bad people with Saul. You can see the good people with David praying not to let your Holy Spirit leave. So that's the Old Testament. What about the New? Well, in the New Testament, we can read John chapter 14. John chapter 14. A lot of messages are preached on God the Father. A lot of messages are, are preached on Jesus Christ. Not many messages are preached on the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of people out there that don't understand who or what the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit's role is in the Trinity and the Godhead. So I encourage you, if that's you, do a Bible study on the Holy Spirit, pneumatology, uh, the study of the Holy Spirit, and see what you find out. But John chapter 14, verse 16. And Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus is talking about when he dies, he resurrects, and he ascends up to heaven, that the comforter is going to come down. The Holy Spirit's going to come down. And that this Holy Spirit's going to abide with you forever. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the believers. He's talking to the 11 believing apostles. Judas had already left because this is after Judas left the Lord's Supper to portray Jesus in John 13. So here we know that the Holy Spirit will abide, will remain with the believer forever. What's another aspect of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? Well, when you get to John chapter 16, 16 verse 7 through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you, tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The Ascension. And then you see the Spirit coming down in Pentecost. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. See, one of the aspects of the Spirit in the New Testament is to convict and judge uh, the world, the people in the world, okay? The third thing I want to talk about is in chapter 16, verse number 13 and 14. 
how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come he shall glorify me for of for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you so we understand two things about the holy spirit's role ministry in the new testament and two of the roles are the fact that he will speak of jesus christ and he will glorify the father okay and we see this in verse 13 and 14 i'm sorry glorify jesus it says in verse 14 he shall glorify me okay so he teaches of christ and he glorifies christ and if you study the trinity you see the holy spirit speaks in in uh uh, points people to Christ and Christ speaks and points people to the Father and the Father receives all glory So uh, if you study the Trinity, you'll see sort of that like hierarchy uh, if you will structure So three things in the New Testament for the Holy Spirit Number one he indwells a believer forever the moment of salvation He that believeth on me hath everlasting life present tense the moments you gave your life to Christ and you believed him to cover you for your sins and pay the penalty on the cross and he resurrected for your resurrection, you have eternal life from that moment forward. So once that happens, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I believe it's Ephesians 1 that says that the Spirit is the down payment or the earnest of our inheritance. In that first Peter one, we are kept by the power of God unto salvation. And so the spirit is that protection, that sealing, that guarding of our salvation. And no man will pluck us out of the father's hands. And then the spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. And the spirit would go ahead and speak of and glorify Jesus Christ. And we see that. So those are the differences between the old and the new Testament. How was salvation obtained in the Old Testament and how was it obtained in the New Testament? Well, in the Old Testament, you have people that were looking forward. They were looking forward to the, well, to the Messiah, not the cross, but to the coming Messiah. And so even back in Genesis chapter 3, you have the fall. And you have the messianic promise that the Messiah would come and crush the head of the serpent. And then when you read in chapter 4, I believe it is, when Adam and Eve had their first child, Cain, that Fruitenbaum points out the fact that how it's read in the Hebrew makes it believe that Adam and Eve thought that Cain was the Messiah, where it says, and he has given me a child, the Messiah, I believe is how it is. And so in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to the promise and the coming of a Messiah. You see with Abraham, with the blessing of the seed. You see this with the sacrificial system. In the Mosaic Law, the Levitical system, you see it with the Day of Atonement, with the Passover lamb and Exodus and everything else. Everything is looking forward to a coming Messiah. In the New Testament, they're looking back at Messiah. Old Testament looking forward, New Testament looking back. The same object of faith is Messiah. In the New Testament, we're looking back at the cross. We're looking at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. And it's all focused on the son or the Messiah. If you were to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18, we read that the preaching of the cross is to them foolishness, <laughs> foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Then you read in verse 2, 9, it is written, I has not seen nor ear has heard, neither has entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I particularly believe this is speaking about the gospel, about the death of Christ on the cross for the sins of the world. I don't believe this is talking about heaven. I don't believe this is talking about eternal life later. I believe this is talking about the gospel presentation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah. So New Testament is looking backward. One of the most vital aspects of salvation is belief in the resurrection. This is one aspect that's omitted a lot of times from gospel presentations. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. So we need the resurrection as to be a core doctrine in Christianity because if Christ is not physically rose and ascended into heaven physically, then he's still dead in his grave, uh, in the tomb, in the sepulcher, wherever it is. And basically he's not the payment for our sins. 
And so the resurrection is of utmost importance to the core of Christianity. So, Old Testament, we see that since the Holy Spirit came and left a person, even David, that they were not indwelled at the moment of salvation. But in the New Testament, we see, and we see from Pauline epistles, like in Ephesians 1, that the moment of salvation that we receive, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And he's the inheritance of our salvation, or he's the earnest of our inheritance. So New Testament indwelled at salvation. Old Testament, not the case. Both aspects, old and new, received eternal life based on the promise of Messiah. Old Testament looking back. New Testament looking forward, okay? Moving on to the third thing. Will there be salvation in the tribulation period? Will people be getting saved? Yes, people will be getting saved in the tribulation period. If you were to read in Revelation chapter 7, now Revelation chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, you could look at both of those passages. But in Revelation 7, verses 9 through 14, and this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hand. Then it goes on to say, and one of the elders answered and said, What are these arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said, Sir, thou knowest. And he said of me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. I have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Then verse chapter 13, we got chapter 13 verses, where are we at? Seven and eight. We're talking about the mark of the beast. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome him. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. So here we see there are two people during the mark of the beast period. Number one, the people that are written in the book of life, they're there and they will ultimately be martyred. And then number two, people that are not written in the book of life, those unbelievers. There is salvation during the tribulation period. Also, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Paul speaking about the Jews in Israel, talking about the spiritual blindness. He says that in 25, verse 25, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So Jewish people will be getting saved during the tribulation period. You have the 144,000 witnesses of Revelation 7 and Revelation 12, I believe it is, and that are going out proclaiming the gospel to the world during that period. Men, and one other thing I want to point out is salvation during the tribulation period. It's interesting to find out that there's a threefold drawing aspect. You can probably hear my dogs. There's a threefold drawing aspect unto salvation. We're told that the Father draws people to himself in John 6:44. We are told that Jesus the Christ draws people when he was lifted on the cross. And then we see John 16, 7 through 11, that the spirit reproves the world, convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. There's this threefold drawing uh, of salvation. And so I personally believe that there's this threefold drawing that is going to remain the same during the, uh, during the tribulation period. Okay, so we see salvation in the tribulation period. We see that the Jews will be getting saved. There will be a lot of Gentiles that are saved as well. We'll look at the remnant of those people here in a moment. But what will the work of the Spirit be during the tribulation period? Will the Spirit even be there? Okay. I believe that the Holy Spirit's act, uh, action, his ministry, will be more similar to the New Testament than he would be with the Old Testament. Now, I originally thought Old Testament more so, but the more I looked at it, the more I believe his role will be similar to the New Testament as opposed to the Old Testament. Reason being, if we go back to the Holy Spirit's role that we talked about first, that the Spirit came upon certain individuals, we don't read in the book of Revelation or tribulational passages where the Spirit necessarily comes upon individual people, good or bad people. There's no reference on that. I haven't found anything. We haven't seen that the Holy Spirit will depart from people that the Spirit goes into. Okay, so there's no reference for that either. 
we do look at the fact of the Spirit indwelling people, sort of like Joshua in the book of Numbers, that and that's quite possible that the Holy Spirit will be doing that in the tribulation period. In regards to the New Testament, the three aspects of the New Testament, we read in John 14, 6, that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will abide forever. I don't see necessarily a reference that the Holy Spirit's ministry of abiding forever and dwelling ceases after the rapture. Okay, and I'm going to talk about the Second Thessalonians 2 here in a moment. So that is very quite possible that the Holy Spirit will still be indwelling an individual believer during the tribulation period. Spirit reproves the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. While I do believe that threefold aspect of drawing with the Father, Son, and Spirit will be present, I don't believe it's going to be for the world, as John chapter 16, Jesus says in there, that the entire world will not be reproved or convicted, that certain people will. And then the third aspect speaks of and glorifies Jesus Christ, John 16, 13, and 14. I believe the Holy Spirit's role will also be speaking and glorifying Jesus because we see the 144,000 witnesses going out proclaiming the gospel. And so the gospel is preached. You can't have a gospel with the death, burial, and resurrection. And so I believe the Spirit's going to be behind that message for the conviction of those people that would believe. So what else? Old Testament passages. John, Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and 29 says the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon the sons and daughters. They'll dream dreams and have visions and they'll prophesy. I believe this is going to occur prior to the sixth seal. I believe it is in Revelation 6 when the moon becomes black as sackcloth and, or the sun becomes black as sackcloth and the moon turns to blood. And it's not a blood moon like today or a hunter's moon, whatever it's called. This is something unique, a sign in heaven. Uh, so we do see that the Spirit will be poured out upon sons and daughters, probably of the Jewish people, to prophesy, to teach, and give knowledge, and things like that. Zechariah 12.10. Zechariah 12.10. Let's see how quick I can turn there with it being near the end. Oh, that was pretty quick. Zechariah 12.10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. Chapter 13, verse 9. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say it is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. Here we get the Jewish remnant. The Jewish remnant that's spoken of, that's being protected for three and a half years, in Revelation chapter 12, that these individual Jewish people will have Holy Spirit poured out upon them. The Holy Spirit will give that conviction. They will give that... He will give that knowledge to these Jewish faithful remnant. They will go ahead and look back at who Messiah was, who he's supposed to be and claims to be, and they will repent, turn their mind as far as who they originally thought he was to who they believe he currently is. They will look upon Jesus whom they have pierced, the Jewish people. And so they're going to turn to Christ, become Messianic Jews at that point, the faithful remnant. So the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And so the gospel is going to be preached throughout the entire world. You can't have a gospel without Christ. You can't have the gospel without spirit uh, uh, being the catalyst of giving that gospel. And so you have that aspect. Now the debate could be whether this gospel presentation is prior to the rapture or immediately after the rapture. I'm going to leave that up to you to decide. But if you go onward to verse 24, it says this is very interesting. This is after the abomination of desolation. So you're looking at the second half of the three years. Uh, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. This points out that there's going to be false prophets, false messiahs uh, during the tribulation period. In the fact that those people that are saved, those elect, uh, whether it's speaking of the Jewish remnant or whether it's speaking about Gentiles and all believers that are saved during that time, 
the spirit will be protecting them to be sure that they will not be deceived by the signs and the lying wonders of these false prophets and messiahs. So here you have an aspect of the Holy Spirit giving them wisdom, giving them knowledge, giving them discernment so that they are not deceived. So the spirit would be doing that as well. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is what started all this discussion. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 says, Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. The passage, a lot of people look at that verse and, and they say, see, the Holy Spirit's going to be removed. But if you read it closer, you see that, number one, the Holy Spirit still got an active work here on the earth during the tribulation period. But number two, it gives a picture of not necessarily being taken away, but stepping aside. That the Holy Spirit that is here that's protecting us from all sorts of evil and wickedness, uh, although we see a lot in the world today, it could be, and we can see in Revelation, a lot worse. That 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 says that the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily will be gone, but the Holy Spirit will step aside and allow these things to happen. Remember that the tribulation period is a specific work of God. It is for God because of God to the Jewish people. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 verse 24, there are six purposes to the tribulation period. And mainly the tribulation period is to break the Jewish people to get them to repent on who they believe the Messiah is and to turn back to Christ, ultimately being the catalyst of calling for Christ to return in his second advent. And so the Spirit will step aside allowing that judgment to happen for God's purposes of Daniel 9 24 uh, and again if you read that passage in Daniel 9 you'll reveal that uh, the tribulation period has to do with thy people and thy city when he's speaking to Daniel who's Daniel's people the Jews who's his city Jerusalem because he kept praying towards Jerusalem that's where he was from and so we got to remember that tribulation period a lot of horrible things are happening uh, it's because of God's judgment on the earth for the wickedness, but to go ahead and fulfill six purposes, all having to do with the Jews in the city of Jerusalem. So in conclusion, to bring all this together, what do I believe the Holy Spirit? Will the Holy Spirit be present during the tribulation period? What is the work of the Holy Spirit during the tribulation period? I'm just going to read my conclusion because I like how I typed it out, okay? I believe the Holy Spirit will be present during the tribulation period. His omnipresence requires his presence during this seven-year period. His purpose to protect believers from being deceived requires his presence. The preaching of the gospel requires his presence. The Spirit's work will empower, protect, and teach the believers. Also, I do not find scripture stating that the Spirit does not indwell a believer in the tribulation period or that the Spirit departs a believer as David prayed in Psalm 51:11. When Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit, he didn't reference a time of which the Spirit would return back to heaven, simply stated he would abide with you forever, a statement not made in the Old Testament. It is this guy, the guy behind these two thumbs, opinion, that the Holy Spirit is very active during the tribulation period and very present for his people, the believers, during that time. So, if you were to ask me about the Holy Spirit, his uh, presence there in the work, this is what I would say. It was an interesting study. Uh, if you disagree, cool. More power to you. If you agree, cool. More power to you. Uh, and you can drop me a line in the comments below. Let me know your thoughts, uh, where you think that I was wrong. Yeah, I'll tell you where, where uh, you know, possibly it's true, but possibly it's not. I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and argue about how many angels can stand on the he pinhead of a needle. But doing some systematic studying, we could sort of uh, distinguish that, yes, the Holy Spirit will be here. And that the Holy Spirit will actually be working. And like I said before, I think it's going to be very similar to the New Testament's work of the Holy Spirit as opposed to the Old Testament's work of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, like I said in the beginning of the video, if you like the videos, if you like these channel, this channel and everything, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And go ahead and check out my other videos as well. So until next time, uh, God bless.